Hey everyone, I'm Jennifer Whitaker, Trauma Specialist, and I'm back for the fifth video in a series that I'm doing on Dr. Steve Hassan's bite model of authoritarian control. And today's topic is E, emotional control. And the bite model of authoritarian control was developed by Dr. Hassan to describe the specific methods and tactics that authoritarian groups, leaders, and individuals use to recruit and maintain control over other people. And this gets into, you know, just like I've said in the past three videos, the puppeteer and marionette dynamics. Because once the puppeteer has control, it only takes very subtle, very tiny, small, and nuanced movements of that cross brace and the strings to get big reactions and big movements out of the marionettes. And oftentimes we don't see these subtle movements with the naked eye. And that's why it seems so magical or esoteric or enigmatic or mysterious. However, just like there being a very specific technique to being a puppeteer, there is also a very specific technique and a specific method to being a manipulator and a controller and possibly even crossing that line and becoming an abuser. And if it were so easy to spot, none of us would ever find ourselves in those situations. But like a camouflaged animal out in the wilderness, sometimes they're not easy to see. And because of that camouflaging and how things hide within the subtleties and the nuances, and because it's harder to spot, that's why the bite model is important to understand because the bite model can help us see and pick apart those specific methods and tactics. Now to use the bite model most effectively, think of one single relationship or one single situation at a time as you go through the different categories of the bite model and only evaluate that particular relationship. And if you wanna follow along with me, please go to freedomofmind.com that's Dr. Hassan's website. And in the drop down menu under education, just uh, choose, I think it's the option that says Steve Hassan's bite model of authoritarian control. All right, everyone, I'm Jennifer Whitaker, trauma specialist, and I want to welcome you to my channel. It's great to have you here. If you're finding this information on the bite model and what to look for, if you're finding it helpful that I'm sharing it with you, please give me a thumbs up and be sure to share. Um, and subscribe. And on YouTube, don't forget to hit that bell so you don't miss any other videos, especially in this series, um, because they all interrelate. And in my humble opinion, this is really important information. So let's jump into the bite model. Um, the first three videos, um, or the last three, sorry, the past three videos are on behavior control, information control, and thought control. And today's topic is emotional control. So let's jump in. And under emotional control, there are nine different categories and several of them, but not all have subcategories. All right. So the first thing listed under emotional control is when another person or group is manipulating and narrowing your range of feelings. So some emotions and some of your wants and needs are deemed as evil or wrong or selfish or bad. Um, and others are okay. So are you being limited in what emotions you are allowed to display? And this happens in families a lot. Now, it doesn't mean all families are cults, but this emotional control is just one light item out of all these lists that, that's pretty common out in the world. Um, and it is a way that in a lot of families, it happens unconsciously. This is a way that when it happens consciously and somebody knows that they're manipulating your feelings and your emotions, they know very specifically what they're doing and the type of response they're going to get. So just start to notice um, like what happens when you say no and somebody has a reaction to that. What's their response? Do they attack you? Um, are they okay with it? You know, so start to look at these little things. Is it unconscious or is it deliberate? Number two, 
you might learn or be taught emotion stopping techniques that will block your feelings and to try to block feelings of homesickness or anger or doubt. Um, so emotion stopping techniques are similar to thought stopping techniques. Um, so with emotion stopping, if you start to feel homesick, um, you may go into a thought stopping type type of technique like chanting or humming as a way to comfort yourself through that. Um, you might start to experience some shame or guilt if you feel anger, which will stop that emotion and cause you to, to um, suppress it. Um, you know, sometimes doubt is not okay because if you have doubt, that means you're not a strong enough believer. So you have to keep those to yourself and stop your own emotions from being expressed. Um, the third thing on the list is to make the victim feel that problems are always their fault. It's never the leader's fault. It's never the group's fault. It's never the family's fault. It's always your fault. Um, and this is one where, um, oh gosh, there's so many different examples for this. MLMs are a good one because MLMs will say, if you're not successful in the MLM, it's your fault because you didn't put enough time into it. Um, you weren't dedicated enough. And if you really look at the reality of MLMs, only about two people um, who are two, per, two people, sorry, 2% of people, big difference there, only about 2% of the people who sign up to become members of MLMs actually end up making money within the company. And it's all the people, the 98% who are losing money and who are struggling, who are funding the profits of the 2%. Um, so again, those techniques that guilt you into keeping going, keep your money dumping into the company and keep feeding the commissions and the paychecks of the people in your upline. Um, number four, promoting feelings of guilt or unworthiness such as identity guilt. And this has several subcategories. Um, you're not living up to your potential and you'll see this with some of the, you know, um, human potential cults or self-help cults that are out there, um, leading you to believe that your family is deficient, um, that your past is suspect, and you have all these things from your past that you have to overcome to be an acceptable human. Um, your affiliations are unwise. Like, I can't believe that you would associate with that group of people, associate with the people that I tell you to associate with. Um, your thoughts, feelings, and actions are irrelevant or selfish if you want to do something for yourself and not something that, you know, the, the abuser or the group is telling you to do. And a lot of social guilt. Um, how dare you want to go off and do something socially by yourself that doesn't include the rest of, of the group members. Um, and historical guilt is another big one. Um, and we're starting to see historical guilt come up in... Um, some social justice cults that are starting to crop up. So you'll see a social justice movement, um, but within that movement, you'll start to see these little culty groups, um, almost like little splinters popping up or little groups who will take the larger movement. And when you encounter um, somebody um, with these more niche belief systems, you start to see the historical guilt. So an example of this is the Black Lives Matter movement, um, where there are there is this certain through line of a cult. Um, not everybody, but it's a very, very small percentage within the Black Lives Matter movement will shame anybody for their um, historical origins, um, where you don't have a right to say anything because, you know, you come from, you know, this lineage and I come from this lineage. So what I have to say is valid and what you have to say is invalid, um, which is just another form of othering. It's another form of us versus them. And it perpetuates these culty dynamics. And don't get me wrong, not all social justice movements. Um, it's not the whole movement. It's just these little factions within it. And then instilling fear um, is another, another big one. Number six, um, instilling fear such as fear of thinking independently, fear of the outside world, the us versus them, um, fear of enemies. Um, and this is really popular with cultic groups, um, you know, Scientology, for example, anyone who's a suppressive person, well, suppressive person is kind of code for they're an enemy of the church. 
Um, there might be an installation of fear of losing your salvation. Um, that's one that happens with the Mormons, for example. You know, if you leave, leave the church and you're no longer within the Mormon church, then your soul is doomed to hell. You'll lose your salvation. Um, leaving or being shunned by the group, shunning and excommunication, um, you know, ganging up on people, being mad at one individual until they step back into alignment with what you think they should be doing. These are tactics that will control someone's emotions, which in turn will control their behaviors. Um, another form of instilling fear is others, the disapproval of others, um, you know, and again, historical guilt kind of goes here too. And a lot of this installation of fear um, is, it, it taps into a primal fear that everybody has. And the primal fear is being ostracized or shunned or becoming a pariah. Um, and somewhere, it's almost like deep inside of us on some biological or genetic level, we know how dangerous being ostracized and left out is because that leads to loneliness. And chronic loneliness can decrease a person's life expectancy by around 30%, which is a big deal. Um, so there is an aspect of survival in being able to maintain connections and be included in a group. And so if you know that if you leave the group, you're going to be shunned and you fear being alone and ostracized ostracized that can keep you in an unhealthy situation. Number seven, extremes of emotional highs and lows. Um, so this goes into the cycle of abuse, which I've talked about in a past video, where you might have the love bombing or the idealization phase and being praised one moment and then devaluing you or discarding you or declaring you as, you know, a horrible sinner or, you know, some you know, wretched person or how dare you, you know, you're just discarded. Um, so going through these extreme emotional cycles is exhausting. And once you get back to that love bombing and that idealization stage, then you start to feel those feel good hormones, you know, the, the endorphins and the dopamine and the oxytocin, and you feel really good. And for a lot of people, um, that creates that intermittent reward that can keep us stuck in a situation until that next reward happens. It's almost like a gambling addiction, but a little bit different. Um, number eight is ritualistic and sometimes public confession of sins. Um, and this is another one, you know, like to confess everything that's wrong with you, to confess your sins, you know, to let the group know and to, you know, like lay everything out on the table and expose it. And then some of those things, maybe things that we're not so proud of, because every single one of us has done things in our life that we're not so proud of, or that we don't really want people to know, because it's a little bit embarrassing, like, oh, I can't believe I did that. Those are the things that um, when we're vulnerable enough to share them and confess, they can come back and be used against us. And when it happens in a ritualistic manner, it can lead us to believe, you know, that that's our salvation. If I don't do this, then there's something wrong with me. And number nine, the last one under um, emotional control is phobia indoctrination, which is inculcating irrational fears about leaving the group or questioning the leader's authority. Um, so it can create phobias in people. Um, so, so there are several subcategories under this line item. Um, there's no happiness or fulfillment possible outside of the group. Um, there will be terrible consequences if you leave. You're going to go to hell. You'll be possessed by a demon. You'll end up with an incurable disease because that's what happens to people when they leave you know, our, our church. Um, you'll be in a horrible accident. You'll lose your mind and commit suicide. Um, you'll end up insane and institutionalized. Um, you'll have to go through 10,000 reincarnations before your soul is, you know, saved and on and on and on with the terrible consequences and that fear based, um, fear based thinking and feeling that's installed by, by groups. Um, and even in relationships, there can be, you know, like, you'll never find anybody better than me. Where are you going to go? Um, and hearing that over and over again. Um, can lead you to believe it. Um, another light I know under phobia indoctrination is the phobia of shunning 
those who leave fear of being rejected by friends and family, which kind of circles back to what I was saying a couple minutes ago about being ostracized and that fear of loneliness and how that can shorten our lifespans and the devastation and the heartbreak of being rejected by your own family. If you choose your own path, I mean, my gosh, what a horrible conundrum to be in. Do I choose my family or do I choose what I want for myself? Um, another line item under phobia indoctrination is there's never a legitimate reason to leave. Um, there can, those who leave are weak. Um, those who leave are undisciplined. They're unspiritual. They're too worldly. Um, they're brainwashed by a family or a counselor. Sometimes um, therapy and psychology is really demonized by certain cults. Um, you could be shamed for being seduced by money, like you're materialistic or, um, you know, she, she was seduced by sex and rock and roll and, you know, so demonizing of popular culture. So there's never a legitimate reason to go off and explore the world on your own. And the last line item on phobia indoctrination is threats of harm to ex-members and to family. So if you were involved with a group, but your family wasn't in it yet, and you try to leave, they could very possibly threaten your family, threaten your loved ones. Um, or if you become an ex-member, um, they might follow you around and threaten to harm you. Um, and this also kind of falls under the unhealthy relationships where if you leave, the one person might try to stalk you or um, in the cycle of abuse, it's called hoovering, where they might go back into that love bombing or idealization phase to try to suck you back in so they can maintain that control over you. Um, and sometimes there will be threats of harm to your family members, your children, or other people that you love in your life um, while this process is happening. All right, so that wraps it up for emotional control. So please leave your comments below if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. And if you found this information helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and don't forget, hit, don't forget to hit that bell so you don't miss any of my videos. All right, everyone, I will see you next time and happy self-discovery.